Hi everyone, Adam Steele from Hop Pole Studios here. And today I want to talk to you about something that I think is really important for people to know if you're recording and if you're mixing that's kind of getting lost to time and needs to come back a bit. So I'm going to explain gain staging. Right, so I apologise in advance, this video is going to be a talking head video, this is going to be me explaining to the best of my ability what gain staging is and why it's important to you. This doesn't really have any practical demonstrations, although I might throw a couple of things up on screen, but I should be able to tell you what, what I'm thinking that should portray things fairly accurately. So gain staging is a widely misunderstood term. Um, and there are all sorts of numbers thrown around in modern recordings. Minus 18 and plus 4 dBU. And what does it all mean? Why does it matter to you? Uh, what makes it worth anything? So I'm going to rewind back a little to the 50s and 60s and kind of explain my way through. And hopefully uh, you'll understand why it's important. So... In the 50s and the 60s, when recording engineers were recording onto tape, uh, they would be struggling constantly to get the perfect balance between getting the volume of the tracks loud enough that it was above the horrible hissing noise floor of the tape and of the mixing desk and all the equipment that was the best they had at the time, but still in comparison to what we have now was pretty terrible. Uh, but the balance was between that and pushing the volume too loud and ending up with distortion. In the 50s and 60s, there was a lot of what I call the Wild West in terms of audio levels. Uh, companies couldn't agree on all sorts of things, uh, which I can talk about another time, like impedance and, oh boy, there is so much that was yeah largely not agreed upon but generally out of the engineering of the early 60s we ended up with largely accepted professional standards and one of the main ones in studios was what's called plus four dbu if you look at an older mixing desk they've generally got needles meters they're called vu meters now those meters they only move so fast they don't go at light speed because they're a physical thing, uh, but they are calibrated. And what that means is that engineers will put certain frequencies through them, usually 100 hertz, 1 kilohertz, and a higher, usually 10 or 12 kilohertz, whatever it is. And they would align the needles and the inputs and the mixing desk and the tape and everything. And the white coat lab engineers would make sure that everything was set up so that when the needle was in the middle which had a nice big zero if you look at a lot of old uh, a lot of old mixing desks it might go minus infinity minus 40 20 10 5 and then it goes 0 1 2 3 and then this red and what they would be trying to do is to get the ideal values at that zero point and they decided that the ideal value was the right kind of point where you could get loads of level coming in from the microphones or DIs or whatever it is that the instruments were making so that it got above the noise level of the tape and above the noise level of the microphone preamps and the mixing desk and all the outboard gear but wasn't going to then go over and end up either distorting the preamps or more likely at the time distorting the tape. Um, tape distortion can be great it can be horrible. And if you go too far with it, it really starts to sound horrible. Uh, there are certain early Rolling Stones tracks where the guitars are mostly tape distortion. And at the time it was cool. You listen back to it now in context and you go, ooh, yeesh, uh, because that's pushing the tape too hard. Now, plus four dBU, I'm not entirely sure where that number came from, but the idea was that decibels this is a thing I could do for another video, but decibels are not actually a measurement of anything. 
Uh, decibels are a way of converting any scale so it's readable, so it's not like a millionth, a ten thousandth, a hundredth. Uh, but the idea is that with the needle at zero, that would measure on the dBU scale at plus four. And really, really nice preamps and mixing desks could get all the way up to plus 20 something, which the needle couldn't show you. The needle would be absolutely in the red. But if you had a kick drum or a snare that had a real big whack, that would go way louder than the needle could go, but hopefully still not enough to completely obliterate and destroy the sound of whatever you're recording. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the thing we've come to know as headroom. Now, when you were recording on tape, headroom was really important on the way into the tape because when you played it back, generally speaking, those big clicks and hits, they would be kind of gone because the tape, depending on the formulation of the tape, the machine, all sorts of setup, there's only so much level that you can push onto a tape and beyond that, it will kind of saturate, it will softly not add much more. Which is why tape, in a lot of ways, got its reputation for being kind of fat. Because what that means is you would hit the tape with loads of spike and transient on a kick or a snare. And you would get a little bit of that hit, but you'd also get a bit of the big whoosh of that drum afterwards. So the overall sound, instead of sounding like a click, would sound like a fat kind of kind of sound. To give you an example. Um, and that's all to do with the headroom that was available and the desks being calibrated to a certain point. Now bringing this on to why in modern terms this is relevant to you. Uh, as tape faded away and we moved into the digital world, originally uh, digital devices were calibrated in a very similar kind of way, uh, where you would have headroom, you would have a certain amount above that zero on the needle that you could go before it would distort. But anyone who's actually really badly distorted a digital system before will know just how disgusting it sounds if you actually go above the the absolute maximum that you can go to with any kind of digital system. It's awful. It doesn't saturate in the way the tape does. It's not nice. It's awful. And then we get onto the DAW era. Digital audio workstations, Pro Tools, Logic, Cubase, Reaper, all the rest. And um, these don't show you the meters in the same way uh, because the meters that you have in something like Pro Tools or Cubase are very faithful to the exact amount of level that's coming in. And we read things now in a very different way, where the analog needles read at plus 4 dBU, we now look at a completely different meter, and that meter is dBFS. Now, there's a major difference here. Uh, dBU was calibrated so that when you saw the zero on the needle, you could have volume lower than that, but you could also have volume significantly higher than that. The zero is actually kind of a middle point. Um, DBFS has a literal limit. And the way that it's been decided by whoever came up with this, that DBFS is measured, is that uh, zero DBFS is the absolute maximum. You cannot go louder than that. If you do, uh, horrible digital things happen and it sounds awful. Uh, it sounds absolutely disgusting. A lot of modern DAWs handle it more gracefully than old ones. A lot of digital to analog converters handle it a little more gracefully, but still it sounds relatively disgusting. Uh, now, what that means is you, you have to try and equate analog levels, where we used to measure it with DBU, and digital levels. So what we found out over the years really is that plus four dBU uh, on the scale where you get that nice zero on the meters, uh, on digital systems, they have a theoretical headroom that goes to plus 24, which means there's another 20 decibels of headroom above that analog needle 
because if that's plus four and it's calibrated to zero, if you add another 20, that makes 24. I might be getting that a bit rough in my head, but that's roughly where it lands. What that means is zero dB on our modern Reaper, Pro Tools, Cubase system, whatever, is actually the needle screaming at 20 dB above that red. The needle in the analog meters would be bouncing off the top and bending. It's so ridiculously loud in comparison, which is in some ways you would think kind of cool, but there can be negative repercussions from that. Now, going back to the old analog stuff, um, you hear a lot of the rock and roll guys saying this thing sounds better when it's in the red. What in the red means in analog terms is you're going way above that zero. You're making the meters go into the red, so above zero. What analog guys probably wouldn't have realized unless they were real like white coat lab boffins is that even though they were going into the red, they still had quite a lot of headroom. They still, they were probably distorting the preamps in the desk a little bit, probably pushing the tape quite hard. Even newer tape uh, formulations, there's one that I know of called GP9, where that was set that it wouldn't start to distort until 9 dB above zero, which is still way away from that 24 dB that digital systems can do. And so that means that if you were driving at the level that a lot of modern producers look at the levels on their system, then you're going to find that if you use any sort of like analog tape plugins that are trying to do a similar thing, usually those plugins are calibrated to work at similar levels to what the analog guys were used to, because that's how you get the saturation. You give it the ability to go 10, 20 dB over so that you can run it in the red and it will behave exactly like those analog guys were expecting at that level. This is the kind of problem we run into. What a lot of guys don't realize with modern uh, digital systems and really nice modern preamps is that quite often we're running them way too hot and they don't necessarily distort like a guitar amp would distort. It's subtle, it's a little bit, and it can be quite pleasing to a point. If we distort every single track that we make, that can actually end up with some quite negative buildups. Um, I've found in the past that um, digital mixes that have been driven too loud end up with what I call a not very defined mid-range. They become woolly and fuzzy, to use a couple of terms. And part of that, I think, is that either the preamps or the analog to digital converter chips are being run so much louder than they're supposed to be run at. They're not distorting, they're not clipping, but there is something in those chips that is saturating in a way that we didn't expect. And like a lot of mixing, I find that the small details can get missed on the way in because you don't really hear it until it adds up. When you've got 20 tracks, 30 tracks or more in these big dense mixes that people go for now, those small details multiply. And so several years ago, I was finding that this was a problem and started to look at my own mixes and what the problems were. And so problem number one, and this is something that will affect a lot of you guys watching this video, is that you would track each track at what looks like reasonable levels in your DAW. Maybe the peaks are like minus six, minus five. It's nowhere near clipping, doesn't look bad, must be fine. In theory, that is fine. If each track that you've tracked sounds great, no problem. But if you've got all your faders now at zero dB and you press play, if you've got a full drum kit, guitars, bass, vocals, the lot playing, you're going to look at your master output and it's going to be massively over. It's going to be in the red like you wouldn't believe and in the digital kind of red, not the good kind of red. Now, what's happening there? All your levels look right. This is what happens with audio. Think about this for a second. You've got oh, 30 channels going. If they're all making noise at the same time, 
That adds up. It doesn't average out. It literally adds together. If you had two guitar channels that were a certain volume and you put one on top of the other, it sounds louder because the two have added together. You start doing that with a whole mix and that suddenly gets so much louder than you thought. It's just that simple maths. Um, decibels, like I said, can be a, a strange thing to get your head around. But if you had two identical signals and you add them together, they are now six decibels louder. That's to do with the maths with 20, logarithm 10, all, all that kind of... We can get into it. It's verifiable. It's checkable. That's the way the audio logarithms work. It's 20 log base 10. Blah, 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 blah. That's the nerdy stuff. But yeah, if I had two identical signals, they become six decibels louder. If I already had my audio coming in at what looks like a nice safe minus six, add two of them together, that's got another six decibels on it. That's already at zero dB. That's at the maximum. Any more than that is already going to clip. Now, aha, I hear you say, I can just turn all those tracks down. Yes, you can. But firstly, then, all your meters are way down, or you're using plugins to turn it all down. Why not just track uh, less loud in the first place? If it doesn't sound loud enough to you, you turn up your headphones or you turn up your speakers. You don't turn up the source. That way, when you've got all of these tracks, they add together and your master bus is still not clipping, which means that then you've got lots of room to use lovely compressors, saturators, limiters to make the whole thing sound big and punchy and loud. And you're not actively firefighting against the kind of distortion you didn't want. The other thing, and I mentioned it earlier, is that any sort of plugins that you use that attempt to pretend to be analog style, they won't sound right if you track with levels that are way too loud into them. And that's just because uh, as engineers, we're used to hearing quote unquote properly tracked material from the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s. And what's happening is that we are sending far too much level to these like virtual compressors, virtual EQs, virtual preamps, all that kind of stuff. And we're ending up with a lot more distortion in different ways at different times than we actually wanted. And like I said, not gritty distortion like industrial metal or like a guitar amp, but subtle bits of distortion that just make everything less clear over time, which might be what you're going for. And if it is all the more power to you, do it. I'm certainly not going to stop you. I'm not your dad. But be aware that that is what you are doing. Um, if you're going to track really loud and hit uh, virtual plugins really loud, make sure it's a conscious choice and not something that you just weren't aware of. Um, I've definitely found over the years that now I'm running at much closer to analog levels and everything just sounds way better than it used to because I'm not fighting distortion that isn't there because I said so. If I want something to distort, I can. I can use virtual preamps. I can use real preamps. I can use all sorts of wonderful equipment, software that's at my disposal. But when I don't want it, it's just not there. I'm not actively having to fight it. And quite a lot of the time, even in like big rock and metal distort distorted kind of mixes, you quite often don't want as much distortion on certain tracks like the snare. You might want to be quite clean because then it's got a clear pop. Same with toms. Um, same quite often with uh, bass. If I've got two channels of bass, one that's clean on the low end and one that's gritty and distorted, sure, I want the distorted one to be distorted, but the clean one, I actually want to be super clean. That way, the low frequency information, like the sine waves, the 30 hertz, the 50 hertz, whatever frequencies they are, are clean and relatively pure because that way they can make subs rattle and they've not been distorted to the point where the frequency balance of them isn't right and I'm having to struggle with EQs to fight with it. Always a plus. Now, I keep saying distortion, so that's probably the third key point to talk about, is that I do actively run 
the tracks that I track a little bit louder than that analog zero. I like to run what I call in the red. I find that rock and metal mixes tend to benefit from that. But when I say I mix in the red, I'm looking at the analog levels and I'm looking at the digital levels and the digital levels look from what everybody's used to pathetically low and small. But what's actually happening is the analog gear I'm running through on the way in is running hot. It's, it's adding harmonic content. If I've got, say this, this lovely drama unit I've got behind me, this is a valve preamp and compressor. If I run that pretty hard to the point where the needles for the output are pinging off the top, that might still come into a, a converter that's just line level at minus 12. And that sounds wonderful. I don't need to push it any further than that because there is such thing as too much of a good thing. And again, I'm throwing a lot of numbers around. This is where um, I like to give a good example of how I do gain staging. I am not as meticulous with it as you might think, having talked about all this, but I have a little system that works for me. Uh, and the little system goes like so. Um, if it's a rock and metal mix, it's, it's, it's easier to do. Um, I start with a signal that is pretty much just a block of noise. What do we have that's a block of noise? I'll tell you what we've got. We've got distorted guitars, like this lovely rev amp that's slightly out of shot here. So I will get a really distorted guitar and just smash that guitar. I mean, through, through the cab, through the mic, through the preamp, get all through the chain. And I'm looking, if I want it to be on the perfect analog zero, to have the level somewhere around minus 18 on the system. And like I say, I like to run it in the red, so I run near a minus 15. So that's a few dBs louder, but that's still relatively quiet looking. Now, if my speakers aren't giving me the level that I want, uh, I turn them up. I don't touch the preamp. And then suddenly everything sounds about right because that minus 18, minus 15, that is the rough kind of level where guitars are going to sit. And then if I start going chug, 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 the low end on the chugs might be 3 dB louder. So that kind of peaks minus 12, maybe. Uh, that's still a little loud. Um, I try and get it so that the chug, chug, chugs, uh, the palm mutes, do hit about minus 15, minus 14. That way, when I start tracking drums, I've got a bit of a guide to set my drum levels to. And when I do that, I find that sometimes the kicks and the snares, especially with a really heavy dynamic player, they spike to almost at zero dB on their digital systems. They are going crazy, but that is because of the transient. And the transients, or the hits, the initial crack, didn't really get through on analog systems. And on digital, there it is. Now, if you're using... Uh, analog compression and things like that on the way in, your drum levels may differ from mine. It might sound big and fat and actually register minus six, minus eight. Whatever your numbers are can be quite genre dependent. Generally speaking, I also find that the uh, physics holds true that every octave that you go down, um, it's uh, much louder in terms of decibels needed uh, because that's just the way that perception works and all that kind of thing. So yeah, I try and track my drums along to the level of that distorted guitar. And that way, if I can hear my drums nice and clearly and they're not drowning the, the guitar out, even though some of those numbers look wrong, they look like minus six, minus three, when there's a really big hit coming in, uh, the overheads probably won't be nearly as loud looking. The room mics won't be as loud looking because they don't have as big a set of transients. And what I find then is that when I add more bass, more guitars, more synths, more vocals, everything comes out of the master bus at pretty much the perfect volume. And if I start adding analog compressors, plug-in compressors, plug-in EQs, all that kind of stuff, they behave as we expect them to do. And it all sounds wonderful. So hopefully this little lecture about gain staging, and like I said at the start, I apologize for this being a long talking head soapbox video. <laughs> Hopefully this has given you some room to, to think about changing the way you work, and hopefully the results uh, are something that really help you and make you smile. Thanks for watching everybody.
Hope you found this useful. If you did, let me know in the comments. Uh, hit the like button. It really helps to spread this kind of thing further because explanations of why we do things are so important. So thanks for watching, everybody, and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye. Hey, everyone. That might be the end of the video, but if you fancy carrying on this conversation, we have a Discord server. Link is in the description. We're also on Patreon, which is something you can really help us with. We also are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Hop Hole Studios. See you there.